The National Desk, America's News, now. Developing now. Ongoing increases will be appropriate. The fight against inflation, not done yet. Why the Fed says another interest rate hike is necessary, as it warns more could follow. Plus, health care emergency. Why more Americans are missing out on vital treatments as prices at the doctor just keep rising. Then, miscount concerns. A new White House border plan under fire. They're masking the issue. They're shifting the, the, the burden to the ports of entry. They're not doing anything to reduce the flow of illegal immigration. The true number of migrants entering the southern border now in question. To the crisis in the classroom. New estimates doubling the cost of President Biden's student loan plan. Plus, the curriculum battle taking a turn in Florida. Then, war warning. The fact check team investigates a concerning claim of looming combat between the U.S. and China. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Didi Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following all week. First, spending clash. Republicans and Democrats present their case to address the debt ceiling crisis, the clock ticking to avoid a default. Plus, classified concerns. Another day, another search for documents. The FBI continues its probe as Republicans prepare a full-scale investigation into the president's handling of materials. Then, the fight for justice. Tyree Nichols laid to rest in Memphis, his family now demanding action. And feeling the effects. How higher interest is affecting household budgets, from credit card payments to what you pay for groceries. On Wednesday, the Fed implemented its smallest rate hike since last March, raising the core rate by a quarter percentage point. Now, this smaller jump shows the economy is moving in the right direction. But despite efforts to tame inflation, a recent Lending Club report shows 64% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, up from 61% last year. A few ways the rate hike could take a toll on your household budget, making it more expensive for all types of borrowing. The most common option, credit cards. The rate hike will bring the average APR to about 20%, and Americans are re relying on revolving credit just more and more. The country's revolving credit balance is about $100 billion more than it was pre-pandemic, but there is better news for the housing market. Mortgage rates fell for the fourth straight week. Freddie Mac reports the 30-year fixed rate mortgage averaged 6.09%, and that is down from 6.13% just the week before. Now, the National Desk, Dr. El Nishar, picks up our coverage on the economy with how new job numbers are catching many economists by surprise. Interest rates going up again, but this time by just 25 basis points. While recent developments are encouraging, we will need substantially more evidence to be confident that inflation is on a sustained downward path. The decision follows consistent drops in inflation, both to consumer and producer prices and wages. This week, the Labor Department reporting the amount employers pay for wages and salaries rose by 1% in the fourth quarter of last year, a slowdown from the previous quarter. The Fed and central banks around the world trying to gauge when to declare mission accomplished. Juggling the risk of easing off too soon and letting inflation soar again, or keeping rates high for too long and triggering a recession. The International Monetary Fund tracking how it's playing out around the world. Here, there is a need to sort of stay the course for central banks. It's not yet time to declare victory and go home. Explaining one of the headwinds keeping demand and therefore inflation too high for comfort. Households have accumulated a lot of uh, savings through these last two years thanks to policy and also thanks to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, precautionary right. behavior. And they're looking to spend some of that. There's also the extremely tight labor market. Data out Wednesday showing the number of job openings increased to 11 million in December. On the surface, it may seem like that counteracts the Fed's policies, but economist Layla O'Kane explains why, when paired with a slowdown in wage growth, it's not. 
that means that we're not in sort of this fear of a wage price spiral, which is something that we had been concerned about for a little while as a potential. And that also means that um, inflation is probably going to keep coming down. And that's good news for, for the Fed. A Fed whose members appear cautiously optimistic, but not ready to ease off restrictive policy anytime soon. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nashar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Audra, thank you. Despite a grim economic outlook, Americans rank the government and poor leadership as the most important problem facing the country today, according to Gallup, followed by 15 percent who said it was inflation and immigration in third place at 11 percent. On Capitol Hill, an investigation into billions of taxpayer dollars prosecutors say was lost to COVID fraud. This week, I took a closer look at federal spending and the government's ability to stop fraud going forward. Experts tell me what we're seeing doesn't just relate to the COVID era, but is a result of what happens when any type of government spends large sums of money quickly. We owe it to the American people to get to the bottom of the greatest theft of American taxpayer dollars in history. The House Oversight Committee held a hearing Wednesday on federal pandemic spending. They're digging into the roughly $5 trillion in COVID relief aid under the Trump and Biden administrations. A watchdog tasked with oversight of pandemic aid says the government gave $5.4 billion in COVID aid to small businesses with questionable social security numbers. I felt like it was such a trust system and it was just... So sad to see people take advantage of that when there are little businesses and even, you know, medium businesses that really, really needed it. Experts in anti-corruption and fraud say COVID-19 brought unprecedented spending and fraud. I think that with this particular pandemic and the spending, I think we went a little bit too far into the lower the procedures in order to get the money out the door. She points out massive government spending has and will happen. So planning for future emergencies is important. When the inspectors, when the investigators, when enforcement officials are saying, please make sure you're implementing these additional protocols to reduce corruption and fraud, those things need to be, you know, they need to be listened to and those protocols need to, to be put into place. Now, some have challenged the motives for the GOP-led hearing. So far, there have been more than 1,000 convictions related to COVID relief fraud. The Government Accountability Office says the number of people facing fraud-related charges will likely grow. Right now, the latest developments in the FBI's search for classified materials at the Indiana home of Mike Pence. The former vice president's lawyers revealing last month they found several documents with classified markings and turned them over to authorities. Sensitive documents have also been found at non-government locations with ties to former President Trump and President Biden. All of these now under investigation. President Biden's document debacle hasn't had a big effect on his job approval rating, according to the latest Associated Press poll. Take a look. It finds 41 percent of Americans approve of the job the president is doing right now, down just slightly from the 43 percent approval he got last month. Developing now, the U.S. military began tracking a suspected Chinese spy balloon spotted flying over Billings, Montana earlier this week. You can see on your screen right here the state home to one of three of the country's nuclear missile silo fields. The Pentagon says they took immediate action to make sure the balloon did not collect any sensitive data and advised the president against shooting it down because of the potential risks to civilians. The balloon is roughly the size of three buses. This all comes alongside a major war warning this week. The prospect of war with China growing as the country looks to invade Taiwan. The U.S. and mainland China now both bolstering their defenses. The fact check team breaking down how prepared the U.S. would be if war is on the horizon. A leaked internal memo penned by an Air Force general warns of a possible war with China as early as 2025. I'm back with the fact check team. 2025, that's right around the corner. Would the U.S. be ready today? Well, Eugene, some defense experts say if a war were to happen with China, the U.S. could run out of certain military weapons in less than a week. Now, that assessment is from a new report from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We learned they're a bipartisan think tank focused on national security. Now, they say with our support to Ukraine, Americans 
weapon supplies of certain types of weapons are lower and some of the equipment hasn't been replaced. Things like tank ammunition rounds and missiles, just to name a few. And what about China? How stocked are their arsenals? Right, so we found a government report that shows China is increasing their defense budget every year. Now, I have a chart there on your screens. In 2021, China's defense budget increased by 6.8% to $261 billion. The Pentagon projects China could be spending as much as $270 billion on their defense this year. But keep this in mind. The U.S. has set aside almost $817 billion this year for our nation's defense. Very big difference there, appearing to favor U.S. forces, thankfully. Now, with two world superpowers involved, Connor, what did you find on concerns of potential use of nuclear Right, weapons. Eugene, it's a very scary thought, but some people might find comfort in knowing that just last year, both President Biden and China's President Xi Jinping agreed that nuclear war must never be fought and specifically opposed the threat of nuclear weapons in Russia's war against Ukraine. But our government is tracking China's nuclear weapons closely. For any specific concerns? Or? Pentagon's latest annual report on China, they say China will likely have a stockpile of about 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035. They estimate China China has more than 400 right now. And those efforts are slim compared to the stockpile here in the U.S. According to the World Population Review, the U.S. has over 3,700 active warheads. And hopefully not a single one will need to be used. Ladies, thank you so much. And for more on this fact-check team topic, including links to where they found their information, scan the QR code you see there on your screen or visit us at thenationaldesk.com. Ahead on the National Desk, America's News Now, the latest city calling for accountability from police. The cell phone video prompting demands for body camera on all officers. Plus, a school administrator in Rhode Island now on leave. The email raising concerns over a student's safety. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in West Virginia, where the state Senate passed a bill that would require all public schools to display the national motto, In God We Trust. Maybe they'll look up one day and say, In God We Trust, and know, and know, that they can put their hope in God. Senator Mike Azinger following in the footsteps of another senator friend in Virginia, introducing a bill requiring all public schools to display a durable poster or framed copy of the United States motto in every building. I had not seen or heard uh, any, any opposition. It ran through uh, education committee with, without a problem. Not a single West Virginia senator voted against this bill Monday, but do the constituents agree? Online West Virginians voicing concern. We know that this is this is something that's easy for folks to vote for. We know that's something that, that they'll be attacked for voting against. Some concerns about this bill, it mixes government and religion too much, among other worries. We recognize that this is uh, considered the national motto, but it's also something that makes a lot of people who are non-religious um, feel very uncomfortable. President Dwight Eisenhower creating the motto in 1956. According to Azinger, the phrase was coined to bring unity to the country. This bill is meant to bring more patriotism to schools, but opponents say it's distracting from the real issues in the state's education system. It's just gonna um, make 
a few people feel a little bit less welcome. Now over to California, people in Redding protesting after officials say cell phone video showed one officer forcefully stepping on the head of a man during an arrest. Demonstrators now demanding that all officers wear body cameras. Redding's police chief saying the department will test several body cameras before implementing the technology. It'll be a 90 day trial with one vendor um, and then we have another 45 day trial with another vendor that'll run simultaneous to that one. So yeah, we July 1 is, is the deadline, but I'm hoping to bring full implementation before that. Reading police say the incident caught on cell phone video is being investigated. In Rhode Island, an assistant principal in Providence was put on paid leave after we're told she emailed teachers asking them to help pay a debt owed by a student smuggled into the country. The email reportedly saying the student must pay $2,000 before February 1st. Despite many different questions about the message, many are simply concerned for the student's well-being. It's concerning to think that this actually is happening, you know, that, that they, he or she, were brought here um, under those conditions. It's scary. The Providence Public School District says it has launched an investigation into the issue. Just ahead, police reform push after the tragic death of Tyree Nichols, what one expert says law enforcement needs to change going forward. Right now, a fight for justice after Tyree Nichols is laid to rest in Memphis. The Nichols family is demanding action after a traffic stop and a brutal beating caught on camera. Three days later, 29-year-old Tyree was dead. Several now former officers have been charged with his murder. Additional first responders are being investigated. The National Desk, Eugene Ramirez, has the latest, sitting down with a former law enforcement official to discuss the officer's behavior. Joining me now is police training expert Dr. Tyrone Powers, a former Maryland state trooper and FBI special agent. Dr. Powers, welcome to the National Desk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And you often provide expert testimony in court cases concerning use of force. Now, based on the videos released last week, what's your assessment of the Memphis police officer's actions? And did you see anything that would suggest escalation by Tyree Nichols? Now, I didn't see anything that would suggest escalation by uh, Tyree Nichols, and it, it was it was way over the top. There's usually a use of force continuum and a use of force model that tells police officers what type of force they can use to effectuate a legal arrest, depending on whether the individual is compliant, non-compliant, uh, resistant, or combative. This is even way beyond that. This is beyond excessive force into the realm of police brutality, and there's nothing that... Um, um, Mr. Nichols did that would have escalated it to that point. There's nothing, uh, the, the use of force in this case was inconsistent with training practices, um, policies across any police department in, in this particular nation. So this is way outside of any of that. This is just pure brutality. Now, four out of the five officers uh, that have been charged in this and were involved in, in the incident uh, had passed disciplinary complaints against them, including two uh, previously accused of excessive force, uh, only one of those was punished and it was by a written reprimand. Uh, do police departments, or at least the Memphis Police Department, uh, need to be tougher on their own? Yeah, there needs to be, there, there seems to be a culture that allows for this. And we see this a great deal, unfortunately, in these special units. The units are not bad. You need special units to deal with special problems, whether they're the Gun Trace Task Force unit or the Scorpio unit. It's the people in the unit. So disbanding the unit doesn't fix the problem because the unit came into existence. If you look at the mission and the purpose of the unit, it has a good purpose and a good mission. It's the people in it. But there's also a tendency of police chiefs and police commissioners, despite their rhetoric after these events, to allow these units to do whatever they need to do to get statistics, to get crime 
calm down, to set in motion um, events that bring about arrests and evidence and um, make the police commissioner and the mayor and the politicians look good. So they let them be out of control. Now, I, this I, unit I, definitely needed a bright yellow line and more supervision. I, I understand that the personal responsibility uh, for, for their actions, uh, but why is it that so many cities are seeing uh, issues specifically with the officers in these specialized units? Why, why, what's so controversial about them? Right. They lack supervision. And these units are put together to bring about quick results, and therefore they've given them carte blanche to do almost unconstitutional policing. And the chiefs and the commanders and the supervisors don't want to know anything about what they're doing until something like this happened, and then they all go into um, denial. That's why you see it. It needs more supervision. When you have a unit like this, you need even more supervision than you would with a reg uh, regular unit. And the selection process for individuals to go into this unit have to be uh, have to, um, you have to have more scrutiny and, they, and the individuals have to be vetted more and, thoroughly. And, and perhaps more training uh, as well and, and just being tougher with them too. Uh, I don't know if training is the key. Now, all the officers know better than to participate in this mm -hmm. kind of activity. That's not a default to training. No. More supervision, a bright yellow line, and consequences and repercussions when they cross that line. All right, we got to end it there. Dr. Tyrone Powers, thanks so much. Just Thank you. And just ahead here on the National Desk America's News Now, the lawmaker fighting for better care for new mothers, the possible new insurance coverage for women in her state. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, a state lawmaker in Massachusetts is looking to expand screenings for postpartum depression. Her bill would allow women to speak to their provider on the matter at no additional cost. In Florida, a woman found a baby in the woods outside her home. She heard the infant crying, paramedics estimating it was born just an hour before. Those stories and more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, starting Monday, cannabis dispensaries in Missouri will be able to sell the drug for recreational use. Previously, it was only available in the state with a medicinal card. Buyers must be 21 or older. On Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, President Biden will deliver his State of the Union address. It will be his first congressional address in the split Congress. Newly elected House Speaker Kevin McCarthy extended the invitation and will be sitting behind the president. The day after, House Republicans will begin their first public hearing investigating President Biden. The meeting is expected to focus on the events leading up to the 2020 election. 
when Twitter restricted posts about Hunter Biden's laptop and Biden family business dealings. A new milestone in the coronavirus. The White House says on May 11th, President Biden will end the COVID-19 national and public health emergencies. The move would shift the now endemic virus response on public health agencies rather than the federal government. That means Americans will soon have to pay for tests, treatments and vaccines. Right now, House Republicans are preparing to investigate the federal government's COVID response. The health of millions of Americans may be at increased risk due to rising health care costs. A new report saying more Americans are putting off treatment for serious conditions because they can't afford it. The National Desk, Angela Brown, breaks down the numbers. Gallup just releasing its new report. For over 20 years, Gallup has tracked Americans self-reporting delays in medical care in the past 12 months due to cost. One stat really jumped out at me. 27% said they delayed treatment for a very or somewhat serious condition in 2022. Millions of Americans are facing some really tough choices, paying for rent, food, or medical care. Dr. Jen Cotto has seen it firsthand. Years ago, I had a, a male patient who uh, was having active chest pains in the office, and I needed to call 911 and have the EMS called. And he said, before you do that, I need to call my health insurance company to see what the copay for the ambulance ride would be. A new report from Gallup found 38% say they put off medical treatment because of cost. Now that's up 12 percentage points from 2021. Dr. Justin Covey, Cedarville University. We're seeing low-income young adults and uh, predominantly women who are struggling. People are turning to the National Patient Advocate Foundation for help. Each year, they compile their own data. For the first time, those requesting financial help because of cost of living rather than high medical bills or insurance was the highest ever. Usually people find us because they can't afford their health care or they're getting denials. So for people to find us and ask us for help with cost of living, like rent, transportation, utilities, food um, is very notable. And costs could continue to climb. Last year, Aon projecting that employer health care costs will rise by 6.5% in 2023. Insulin prices, uh, cancer treatments, treatments for rare diseases and so many other things. This needs to be affordable. The survey also found that more women were delaying medical treatment than men. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Angela, thank you. Just ahead in our next half hour, the organization saying Biden's student loan plan could cost double what the White House predicted. Why some say their estimates aren't even close. Plus, youth crime concerns, the role of the media when it comes to perceptions on violent crime. You're watching The National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back.
The National Desk, America's News, now. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Taking a look over Capitol Hill, where this week House Republicans began a hearing on what they're calling Biden's border crisis. Democrats say the hearing is politically motivated, pointing out new changes from the Biden administration, like the CPB1 app where migrants from Haiti, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua can apply first, which Chief Patrol Agent Jason Owen says has had an immediate impact. It puts them in a orderly and safe pathway because they're not entering between the ports of entry that frees up the Border Patrol agents to focus on the threats that are out there. Some border experts are skeptical the app could change how migrant encounters are counted as calls to impeach DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas grow. The National Desk Jan Jeff Crow uh, went one on one with former acting head of Customs and Border Protection Mark Morgan earlier this week. CBP1, that's what it's called. That's the mobile app for migrants to seek entry into the U.S. It's, it's been overwhelmed, Mark, as we know, since it was introduced earlier this month. And agents say really all it's doing is shifting the problem to the ports of entry rather than implementing policy to reduce the flow of migrants coming to our borders. And Mark, some lawmakers say this is making it easier to also file fraudulent claims, resulting in even more migrants at the borders. How are agents handling this new technology? What are you hearing about what's happening at the border? Jan, I'm hearing the same. I think you're spot on. It's not surprising that the system is overwhelmed because this administration has given migrants from all over the world a deal they can't refuse. This CBP-1 app is no different than a, a high-tech version of the same catch and release strategy that they've been implementing the past two years. Essentially, this is what they've done, Jan. They, they told migrants from around the world, here's the deal we're going to make you. Rather than illegally enter our country in between the borders, what we're going to do is just get a line, fill out a couple of lines, and we're gonna let you walk up to a port of entry where now from there, we're gonna process and release you in the United States and let you remain here illegally and never lawfully deport you. They've literally legalized otherwise illegal activity. They've, again, they've told the entire world that we're not gonna try to put integrity back in the system and stop the flow from coming. We're not gonna try to stop you from filing what we know the majority of fraudulent claims. We're just gonna turn our back, look the other way and make it actually easier for you to enter the country. So are you saying this is uh, a way for them to be paroled into the country, meaning they would not have to apply for asylum? So simply being from one of those four countries, whether it's Haiti, Cuba, Nicaragua, or Venezuela, is, is, is enough to be paroled into the yeah. country? So that's a good question, Jan. So there's two things going on with the CBP-1 app. If you're from anywhere in the world, you can get onto the app and apply for asylum, walk up to a port of entry where you're gonna be processed and released. If you're from those four countries, Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, and Haiti, you, it's, they're sweetening the deal even more. You can use the same CBP-1 app if you're from those four countries. And just the mere fact that you're a migrant from that country, you, you don't even have to go through the process of faking asylum. You're just gonna be paroled in the United States simply because you're from one of those four countries. And why are they doing it? Because right now, those four countries are, are uh, resulting in some high degree of those that are illegally entering. So again, what they've told migrants from this country, get online, fill a couple of, of, of uh, questions on the CBP-1 app, walk up to a port of entry, and we're gonna release the United States, parole you in, you don't have to claim asylum. It, it's, it's a perversion and a violation, direct violation of our parole laws. Again, they're masking the issue, they're shifting the, the, the burden to the ports of entry, they're not doing anything to reduce the flow of illegal immigration or put integrity back in the system, apply consequences, they're just covering it up, Jan. So this is interesting because does this mean they are now changing how they're counting the number at the border? Yeah, Jan, look, I hope you have me back on. Again, you're spot on. That's exactly what's going to happen. We need to play, pay really close attention because they're already claiming victory because you're seeing the numbers of those illegally entering in between the ports of entry going down. But those that they're processing through this CBP-1 app through asylum and parole, those numbers uh, are exponentially increasing in kind. So we need to watch what's happening in between the ports and at the ports of entry through this app. Okay. Couldn't agree more. A border encounter set a record high last year, coming in at 2.3 million. But so far in 2023, encounters declined 97% in January compared to the month before. 
Now to the crisis in the classroom. President Biden's student loan relief program could cost twice as much as the White House expected. And that is according to economists at UPenn who are estimating the total at $361 billion. The government estimated the enrollment rate would stay constant, but researchers project an increase in program participants leading to the higher cost. Under the plan, some borrowers could see monthly payments on their undergraduate degree loans cut by up to half. Meantime, new data shows the pandemic caused major setbacks in learning for school-aged children worldwide. On average, students lost 35% of a normal year's worth of learning earlier in the pandemic, and they still haven't recovered from those setbacks. The effects were most prominent for students from disadvantaged backgrounds who were disproportionately affected by school closures. Now to Florida, where Governor DeSantis is asking the state legislature to eliminate funding public colleges and universities use on diversity, equity and inclusion programs and classes on critical race theory. The National Des Victoria de Cardenas shows us the debate unfolding in Florida. I don't think it's been a good use of money. Governor Ron DeSantis Tuesday announced he will introduce legislation to ban teaching of critical race theory, along with programs and activities promoting diversity, equity and inclusion, or DEI. We don't dictate whatever universities spend on certain things. Like, I don't agree with, with, with everything, uh, but we don't micromanage every little thing. But there are certain things where you can say, okay, here's a red line. You know, you're not allowed to go there. And that's something that they'll have to respect. I think he wants to narrow the viewpoints allowed on campus. Executive Director of the United Faculty of Florida, Candy Churchill, is concerned the governor's ban is harmful to the university system. Banning diversity, equity, inclusion to me is a move away from democracy and towards authoritarianism. Governor DeSantis says the tens of millions of Florida taxpayer dollars, which are now being spent on DEI and CRT, will instead be used to help students learn to think for themselves. He has also proposed mandatory classes on Western civilization and philosophy. And the core curriculum must be grounded in actual history, the actual philosophy that is shaped Western civilization. And despite pushback from the union and some Democratic lawmakers, Governor DeSantis is confident these changes to focus on education over ideology will make Florida schools more attractive to faculty and students from all over the country. You are going to see people flooding into these institutions. And Churchill claims that the governor's increased oversight and involvement in state-funded colleges and universities is making it more difficult to hire faculty. For his part, though, the governor says it's his job to make sure that taxpayer dollars are responsibly spent. And he also is planning on introducing his proposal before the legislator meets next month. Reporting in West Palm Beach, Florida, I'm Victoria DeCardenas. Victoria, thanks. This week, the president and House Speaker McCarthy met to discuss the looming debt ceiling. The president adamant the limit needs to be raised to avoid a default, while Republican lawmakers are pushing for government spending to be scaled back. The fact check team explaining what would happen if there's no debt deal and the U.S. is forced to default. Congress has to make the next move now that the U.S. has hit its debt ceiling. I'm back with the Fact Check team tonight, crunching the numbers for you at home. What if a deal can't be reached, today? So, Eugene, the U.S. would default on its debt, meaning the country would not have the money to pay its bills. Now, financial experts say the scope is truly unknown because the U.S. has never intentionally defaulted on its obligations, but this would likely lead to a financial crisis and recession that would impact the global economy as well. Sure, pretty scary thought there. Let's make this relatable for everybody at home. What does this mean for the average American? Well, it can mean delays or just no money at all for Social Security and Medicare benefits, tax refunds, paychecks for our men and women in the military, just to name a few examples. And the White House also says interest rates for mortgages and credit cards could go up and stocks and the value of the dollar would fall. Sure, some significant impacts. Now, Courtney, no deal has been reached as House Republicans are urging spending cuts be agreed upon first. So the Treasury Department is now stepping in to buy us some time, we could say. Explain that to us. So Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says 
we should be okay until about June. The Treasury has taken extreme measures to ensure the government can keep operating by doing things like temporarily stopping contributions to retirement and disability funds for federal employees, but that's not a permanent fix. Yeah, and again, it's spending that's holding up a deal? So Republicans are concerned about how the country is spending its money. The Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, said that the country's over $31 trillion in debt will hurt younger and future generations. And they point to countries that saw some negative consequences. For example, Japan's debt led to decades of slow and no growth, and in Greece, large debt led to a financial crisis that could only be resolved with extreme measures, including a bailout. Now, obviously, these countries are different from the U.S., and just because those issues happen there doesn't mean they'll happen here, but it is something that conservatives are pointing out. Sure thing. And of course, we know House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and President Biden are meeting tomorrow, uh, hoping to reach an agreement then. We're going to watch uh, and see what happens uh, then. Now, you can read the team's breakdown with links to where they found their information on this topic by scanning that QR code you see there on your screen or visiting us at thenationaldesk.com. Ahead on the National Desk, America's News Now. Extending hours, the initiative that could give teens more time on the clock at their first jobs. Plus, $200 million mistake. What happened to one state's schools after a big budgeting error? This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bring you the headlines from coast to coast. From extending teen work hours in Ohio to a dream come true for an Alabama girl, we're taking the pulse of America, starting with a big budget error impacting Virginia schools. $200 million mistake. It's money Virginia schools were expecting from the state, but schools are now being told they aren't getting that money by the Virginia Department of Education. Unfortunately, uh, it was our error with this calculation tool uh, on our website. That online tool helps school districts estimate how much funding they'll get from the state. This is an egregious error. I mean, over $200 million uh, just gone uh, that didn't calculate correctly. This is a huge issue to our schools. Loudoun County Board of Supervisors say this mistake is going to impact local budgets. Do we have to put other projects on hold? Do we have to put certain pay raises for a department on hold? I found out that the surplus is about $1.94 billion. So there's plenty of money in the surplus if they want to cover the cost. The Department of Ed tells 7 News schools will get all the money the General Assembly and the governor approved last year. <laughs> So many teenagers today, they spend a lot of time in front of a screen and being able to be in a work environment, especially a work environment like retail, hospitality, just gives them opportunities for customer service and the skills you learn from doing customer service last you a lifetime. Restaurant owners, lawmakers, parents, and even some teens are on board for extending working hours for young teenagers. Many local businesses are currently suffering staff shortages. Sub shops, pizza places, this would be a real, uh, a real boon for them. Mental health professionals say it's important to know your child and how much they can handle. I think it's the parent and caregiver's responsibility to know their teenager and to set up reasonable expectations. Which is exactly what the bill states. Any extra hours have to be approved by a parent or guardian. It's also a balance of figuring out maybe what are the best options for that teenager to grow their social awareness, responsibility, and make sure that they understand this balance in life that as adults we're also navigating through. 
a magic moment is about to happen beside Fairhope East Elementary School in front of this fourth grade PE class to one of their fellow students. Her name is Allie Harold, and that's her dad. Allie has um, some challenges. She has a disease called nemaline myopathy. It makes her muscles weak. So we're here today to do something to make her feel really great. Allie is a big fan of Broadway shows and has always dreamed of traveling to New York to see one. Something hard to make happen because of school and doctor's appointments and all. But what Allie doesn't know is that her dream is about to come true thanks to Magic Moments of Alabama. They do about a hundred surprises like this every year. Each one is so different and so much fun. And that fun is about to begin for Allie. I was planning in New York to sing such a winner and to sing a um, baseball game and to sing a Broadway show. For a little girl who struggles just to be a kid, friends like these and a moment like this are nothing short of magic. She's adorable. Still to come here, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the classified document debacle to the border crisis, plus the Fed's latest interest rate hike. That's next on the National Desk, America's News Now. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. Scott Thuman, our chief political correspondent, big development in the Biden classified documents story. Tell us why the Fed's search of his Delaware beach house is so important. Well, I think it's important, Steve, because it indicates that the FBI is not simply going to take Biden's lawyer's word as the end all. They're going to go ahead and continue to investigate, even if, as has happened in the past, uh, Biden's attorneys say they've searched one of the related properties, come up with classified documents, turn them over, and that's it. The FBI is an obligation to and is now fulfilling that obligation by furthering up, going to those different locations. And now we're seeing it a third time, third spot, this one being President Biden's Rehoboth Beach House. Um, the other thing that's important about it is that it really shows that this case is going to continue to linger. And the president would like nothing more than to put this one to bed put it in the rearview mirror, but instead, this was the week in which we saw Robert Hur, the special counsel, officially begin his investigation. And then the last thing I'd point out, Steve, that was pretty notable is when the White House counsel was asked, have there been conversations about any other locations that maybe have already been searched, but just not announced to the public, or future negotiations to search additional locations? The White House counsel dodging that question, not saying yes or no, uh, and that would lead you to believe that maybe there are further talks. We just don't know yet. National correspondent Christine Frizzau, House Republicans launched their big investigations this past week. What's the key takeaway from their hearing on the border crisis? Yeah, I think the key takeaway can really be summed up in from the opening statement of the chairman of the committee, Jim Jordan, who said under President Trump, the border was secure. Under President Biden, there is no border and Americans are paying the price. That is really the message uh, that Republicans unified around, trying to make the case that, you know, under President Biden, operational control of the southern border has been lost. They threw out a lot of numbers, including 4.5 million. That's how many migrants have been apprehended at the border since Joe Biden took the oath of office. There's a lot of factors here, as you know, though. There are There is a migration crisis. Both Democrats and Republicans acknowledge this for a whole lot of reasons. People are coming here to the United States. Um, so here we have Republicans really trying to hold the Biden administration's feet to the fire. We have at least 15 Republicans who are trying to impeach uh, DHS Secretary Mayorkas. As a result, this is going to be front and center. They call this the Biden border crisis part one because we expect to see many, many more hearings just like this. Democrats, for their part, say, you know what? 
let's do legislation. Let's work together. This is, of course, an issue. There are many, many challenges, but they say uh, yesterday's hearing was simply uh, politicizing the issue and not really actually trying to come to uh, an agreement on what to do next. Many more parts to come on that one. And national correspondent Atra Elnishar quickly, the Fed raising interest rates again. What does this mean for the economy? So they raised rates, uh, Steve, but they did it by the smallest amount since they started this tightening cycle back in March of last year. What this does is it will allow the Federal Reserve by raising interest rates uh, at 25 to 25 by 25 basis points, excuse me, it will allow them to better monitor the uh, lagging effects of their uh, restrictive policies. Now, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said this week that they were able to do this because they see for the first time, by the way, that the disinflationary process has begun. We have seen for months consistent drops in both producer prices and consumer prices, uh, but the reality is inflation is still too high. They will keep rates uh, elevated for quite some time, likely for at least the rest of the year. Audra, Christine, Scott, thank you all. Didi, back to you. Guys, thank you. Still ahead here on the national desk, teen crime confusion. Most Americans think today's youth are running into trouble more than they used to, but the real numbers might surprise you. A prominent theme in society is older generations believing the newest generation is the worst behaved. Some of this bad behavior is believed to include criminal activity. But are today's teens and young adults really that bad? Inside Your World investigates Mark Hyman reports for the National Desk. In the last few years, there have been countless news stories sounding the alarm about rising crime rates. We got crime problems from Portland to Philadelphia now. Property and violent crime are up, and teens and young adult perpetrators are in the thick of it. Please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. A recent Gallup poll found 56% of Americans believe local crime has risen. This is a 50 year high. Nearly 80% believe it's up nationally. That's the highest opinion in three decades. But despite some recent upticks, violent crime has generally been on the decline since the early 1990s. And if the overall trend is positive, then why does the public think it's not? So why is it that people think that crime is up? Well, you know, they're experiencing it through newspapers or television reporting. Josh Rovner is the youth justice expert at The Sentencing Project, a research and advocacy think tank that focuses on youth and adult crime policies. Well, over the long term, we're seeing way fewer kids arrested. So we see a lot less drinking, a lot less smoking, teen pregnancy is down. All of these numbers are moving in the right direction. According to FBI and Justice Department statistics, the violent crime rate today is about half of what it was 30 years ago. And the number of minors arrested for violent crimes has fallen nearly 80% since 1994. What's unclear is if and how state and federal policies to arrest fewer minors have influenced the numbers. So if the trends give us reason for optimism, then why does the public think kids are causing more trouble today? Human beings are creatures of emotion, not creatures of logic. And when they see clips on TV of, you know, gangs going into a department store and stealing massive amounts of things and cars getting smashed, that strikes a chord emotionally. Accuracy in media president Adam Gallette believes public opinion is heavily shaped by news reports and social media. The influential role of the media was a recurrent theme throughout our investigation. We found a recent New York Times article claiming homicide is the leading cause of death among American children. A powerful claim that's not even remotely true, according to the Centers for Disease Control, which tracks all of the nation's deaths. It's another false narrative that America's youth are in the midst of a tremendous crime wave. Frightening images are powerful. Violent protests in cities like Minneapolis, Portland, Oregon, and Washington, D.C. have likely fueled public perception. So, too, have the recent wave of gangs conducting department store smash and grabs. 
Organized retail crimes jumped more than 26% in 2021, according to the National Retail Federation. And despite heavy media coverage, the Justice Department reports carjackings are actually down nearly 80% since 1995. As disturbing as these images are, these sensational crimes are not widespread. In general, the nation's violent crime rate continues to improve in most communities. So we're moving in the right direction? Oh, I sure hope so. For Inside Your World Investigates, I'm Mark Hyman. Mark, thanks. Before we close out this hour, a look at Super Bowl food prices ahead of the big game. A new report from Wells Fargo showing you might not have to spend a small fortune preparing for your spread. A pound of chicken wings is down 22% from last January. Avocados are also down 20% compared to last year. But when it comes to chips and drinks, you won't be so lucky. The average price of a 16-ounce bag of potato chips is up 22%, while beer jumped 11% since. Guess I'll be stocking up on guac. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. And you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you back here next week.